Bibles, and we'll go to Acts chapter number 17. Acts chapter 17, we finally finished up chapter 16 last week, and was looking at it for several weeks there, but the Lord is wanting help, help wanted and help needed, and I hope the Lord spoke to your heart about trying to get involved to help in some shape, form, or fashion in a place and for some people. Let the Lord use you to help someone. And uh, God's helped us so much, the least we could do is try and turn around and help somebody else. And so Acts chapter number 16, the apostle Paul's been whooped, been beat, been treated wrong, thrown in jail, and then asked to leave. And you would think after an event like that, Paul would say, I'm just going to be honest. If this is the way the Christian life is, if this is the way serving God is going to be, I'm going back to Antioch, I'm going back home, and I'm going to sit down and I'm going to suck my thumb, and I'm just going to complain and whine about how bad and wrong God has done me. But that ain't what happens. As a matter of fact, not only does it not deter him, not only does it not hinder him, if anything, opposition in Paul's life is a catalyst. If anything in the Apostle Paul's life, opposition is not a, a roadblock to stop him, it is indeed a springboard to launch him. Uh, when Paul encounters opposition and Paul encounters trouble, it's like throwing it down in overdrive for Paul. It, 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 it almost like, and, and I wish I had more of what Paul has, but there's something in Paul that he realizes and understands that troubles like he had in Acts chapter 16, not only is the devil trying to hinder him, but it is God using what was evil and turning it out for good. And it's almost like it throws gas on Paul's fire. You know what I mean? It's almost like when stuff like that happen, it happens to Paul, it just makes him want to live for Jesus more, want to serve Jesus more. And, and doesn't that seem like that's the opposite of what we see so many times in so many Christians today? That opposition today doesn't make us want to serve more, live more, love the Lord more. It seems like today in American Christianity, when we've had everything given to us and we have nice buildings and no persecution and everything's going good, it seems like minimal opposition to American Christianity absolutely throws the brakes on us and throws us into a tailspin and hinders us. But that's not the Apostle Paul. Man, every time that he has... A, a roadblock in his way, a hindrance, it's just like he just, it just makes him want to go more. God, give us more of that. Give us more of that. And so in Acts chapter number 17, Paul's going to just move down the road about 50 miles or so uh, from Philippi to the place called Thessalonica. Let's read several verses here and we'll make some comments and get into the chapter this morning. Acts chapter 17, verse number 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. So we're going to look at three different aspects of uh, Acts chapter number 17. The first thing we'll look at is the founding of the Thessalonian church. That'll be from verses 1 through 9, the founding of the Thessalonian church, of whom Paul later writes the two precious books of First and Second Thessalonians to. Second, we'll see from verses 10 to 14, we'll see not only the founding of the Thessalonian church, but we'll see the fleeing to Berea. They end up having to flee from Thessalonica, and they go to Berea for a time and preach the gospel there. And then they leave from Berea and wind up in Athens. And from verses 15 to verse 34, we'll find Paul's famous message at Athens. It is so famous, as a matter of fact, on Mars Hill where he preaches this message, it's so famous that to this day there is a plaque of this entire message that Paul preaches. The message starts uh, in verse number 22 and goes all the way down um, to verse number 31, and that entire message is written on a plaque in Greek, and it is at the base of Mars Hill to this day to commemorate this message that Paul preached to the Athenians 
uh, at this place called Mars Hill where they was worshiping all of these pagan and unknown gods. But anyways, we'll get started here in Acts chapter 17 on the founding of the Thessalonian church. Now, Paul is, is right dead in the middle of his second missionary journey. What you'll find when you read the book of Acts is you'll find four journeys of the apostle Paul. Uh, four times that he ends up either going out and coming back. In the last journey, he doesn't come back. Obviously, he goes to Rome and he dies. We have already gone through Paul's first missionary journey. That starts in Acts chapter 13 and it ends in Acts chapter 14. The second missionary journey of which we are reading right now starts in Acts chapter 16 and goes all the way just about to the end or the middle of Acts chapter 18. Paul takes a third missionary journey in Acts chapter 18 verse 23 all the way to Acts chapter 21 and then his last journey will be found in Acts 27 and 28 that's when he's a prisoner going to Rome and this is a journey he'll not come back from now that, that as far as historically and and also as far as for knowing when these churches that he writes to are established those things are important to know most of you probably have maps in the back of your Bible how many y'all how many y'all in the back of your Bible have maps if you got maps raise your hand now I know most of the time those things don't collect anything but dust in the back of the Bible and I understand that but for what we're dealing with in Acts they actually are kind of a blessing to look at and take knowledge of and just see how much landmass uh, the Apostle Paul covers in these missionary journeys and most of you uh, like my well I have one map in the back of this Bible and about every map Bible that I've got in my office has one of the maps in the back says the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul or the missionary journeys of Paul. And normally they've got like colored lines that shows you the first journey, the second journey, the third journey, and then the journey to Rome. Uh, if you've got one of those, um, see me afterwards if you'd like the, the actual references of, of when in Acts those journeys happen. You know, the first journey happens from chapter 13 to the end of chapter 14, second journey from chapter... It just kind of lets you know where you're at when you're going through the book of Acts. But when you look at Paul's missionary journeys, y'all, and how much ground he covers and land he sees, y'all, those would be great trips if you was taking them in cars. Those would be great trips if you were taking them in, in boats with motors. But we're talking about primitive travel, most of it on foot, some of it on maybe horseback or camelback. A lot of it in ships with sails. Brother, we're talking about arduous travel. It's not like they got on the interstate and set the cruise on 75 or 80 and they just head on down the road. We're talking about wild country, wild animals, sleeping out in the elements, um, thieves and robbers and and, and poorly marked roads, you know, some of this stuff ain't even well marked. Some of it is just, okay, where's the next town? Well, it's like, you know, it's, it's east of here. Okay, we'll start going that way. <laughs> you know, it's, it's out that way somewhere. It, 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 we, we sometimes read this stuff and we just think how easy this was. Part of Paul's, uh, um, the, the rigors of Paul's ministry is not just the fact that he gets locked up. It's not just the fact that he gets beat. It's even just the travel to get where he goes and the primitive conditions on the way to get where he's going to. And, and even in spite of all that, Paul just don't quit. God help us, man. So anyways, as far as these missionary journeys, the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, and all that, as far as these journeys, um, Paul, the churches that he writes to later on after the book of Acts, the Roman church, the Corinthian church, the Galatian church, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, such as that, uh, you'll find these churches are established along the way. The churches of Galatia, uh, when he writes, writes to the churches of Galatia, it's not just one church, it's a whole region. So the churches of Galatia are established on his first missionary journey. That was in chapters 13 and 14. Remember when he got stoned at Lystra? The churches of Galatia, that's part of their towns. Lystra is a town in Galatia. He talks about Iconium and the, the place Antioch in Pisidia. He mentions all that back in chapter 13 and 14. So the churches that he writes to in those six chapters of Galatians, he started those in chapter 13 and 14. But this missionary journey we're dealing with today and have been dealing with now for several weeks is probably going to be Paul's most profitable missionary journey because on this journey... He starts and founds the Philippian church that the book of Philippians is written to, 
the Corinthian church, of whom First and Second Corinthians is written to. He stops at Ephesus. Now, I don't know that the church was started there because he actually spends time in Ephesus on his third journey, but he still stops there and probably wins some people to God. And then the church we're going to find at Thessalonica, of whom he writes First and Second Thessalonians to, is started on this journey. So it's a real profitable trip for Paul. A bunch of the churches he writes to in the New Testament is started on this trip. Now we've already looked at the Philippian church getting started in chapter 16. Now this morning we're looking at the founding of the Thessalonian church. The founding of the Thessalonian church. The Bible said in chapter 17 verse 1 that they went down to Thessalonica and there's this synagogue of the Jews there. And I like how the, Paul, how the Bible uh, tells us this about Paul in verse number 2. It says, and Paul as his manner was. Paul had some customs that he was associated with that he did on the regular basis. Now I realize what he's doing here is he's going to the synagogue on the Sabbath with these Jews. But I still like the fact that he had a custom that on the Lord's day, he's at the house of God. Now I realize that's on Saturday and he's going to meet with the Jews. And I realize on Sunday he's probably going to meet with the church. But I still like the fact that it says as his manner was. Can I say it'd probably be a real good custom for you to set aside the Lord's day is the Lord's. We used to believe that in America. We used to believe and, and hold sacred that, that there was a day that was the Lord's day and restaurants shut down and businesses shut down and, you know, and, and folk went to the house of God. I mean, even people that didn't even claim to be saved, folk. I mean, I, I, anytime I think about this thought, the thing that always comes to my mind is one of my favorite episodes of the Andy Griffith Show, and that's that episode called The Man in a Hurry. And uh, Andy and Barney, you know, was at church, and they get out of church, and Barney slept through most of the service and said, you know, that's a great message on sin, and Andy said he wasn't preaching on sin, but Barney didn't know that. He was sleeping. <laughs> but anyways... And they get out, and Mr. Tucker comes walking up. Mr. Tucker's car had broke down, and he says, you know, i got to get my car fixed. got to get my car fixed. And Andy said, you going to get your car fixed today? He says, it's Sunday. <laughs> everything's shut down. He said, what do you mean everything's shut down? And he said, I mean, it's Sunday. We don't, nothing opens up around here. We go to the house of God. We go spend time with family. Evidently, they didn't go back to church on Sunday night, at least at, at their church, on, at the Methodist church they went to there. But regardless, it was the Lord's day. They took knowledge that this is God's day. We got our days, and we got days to do what we need to go do, but, but we're going to hallow a day, set aside a day. This is God's day. Now, I realize every day ought to be the Lord's day if you're saved. Whether we live or die, we're the Lord's. Whether we live, we live under the Lord. Whether we die, we die under the Lord. Every day you are to realize your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. You are the dwelling place of the Spirit of God. And every day God should have your life and your day. But regardless of that, there still should be a specific day set aside. When we're not setting aside a day to work, unless our ox is in the ditch, I understand that. The Lord even talked about that. But a day that, it, this ain't the day for us to make money. This ain't the day for us to do our hobbies. This is the day for us to give God that we're going to worship. We're going to re read his word. We're going to hear preaching and teaching and fellowship with God's people and our family. We're giving God that whole day. It's a great manner to have. Anyway, so Paul, as his manner is, went in unto them for three Sabbath days. For three whole weeks, Paul goes in every Saturday and, and he reasons with them, the Bible says, out of the Scriptures. That's what the Bible said in Isaiah chapter 1. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. And watch what he's reasoned about. Verse 3, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered, risen again from the dead, and this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. You say, what's he reasoning? Well, Paul probably, you know, all they got at the time is the Old Testament Scriptures. There ain't no New Testament Scriptures. Matthew to Revelation hadn't even been written yet. So there are no New Testament scriptures. So how is Paul going to prove to these people that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and he died for their sins? Y'all, it's pretty easy for you and I to do this. We have the New Testament. <laughs> Take you a text just about anywhere, Matthew, Revelation, and you can show someone Jesus is the Son of God, died on a cross, rose again three days later. Hey, it's not that complicated. But let's say all you had was Genesis to Malachi. Do you have enough understanding of an old let's say you did run up against a judeo you know jew a jew still living by the old testament do you know enough old testament to be able to show them that jesus christ was your messiah you say how's paul gonna prove that he's gonna take them to isaiah 53 
and said, hey, look here, this man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, he bore our sorrows, he bore our griefs, he was smitten, stricken of God and afflicted, he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our afflictions, the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed, remember y'all put stripes on Jesus, with his stripes we're healed, he was numbered with the transgressors, they nailed him between two thieves. Yeah, that's, that, that's salvation. It's in Jesus. He's going to take them to Psalm 22. And he's going to read to them Psalm 22 and say, look there what it says. Psalm 22, 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's going to look at them Jews and say, hey, on the cross, Jesus Christ hung there and said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's, he's going to start preaching to them these prophecies of the Lord Jesus. He's going to go back and tell them, look, look at Micah. Thou Bethlehem, Ephrata, that art little among the nations, out of thee shall come forth he that's to rule the nations. His goings forth are of old and from everlasting, Micah 5, 2. He said, hey, that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. He's from old. He's from everlasting. He's going to take them to Zechariah chapter 9 where it says, Your king comes unto you, meek and lowly, sitting upon an ass and a colt, the foal of an ass. Hey, Jesus, come riding into Jerusalem on that colt. He's going to take them to Genesis 22 in types and shadows. And he's going to show, remember when Abraham walked up Isaac to the top of Mount Moriah. And Abraham told him, son, God shall provide himself a lamb. Jesus Christ was God. God provided himself the lamb. Not like the New King James Version says that God shall provide for himself a lamb. That totally destroys the whole doctrine, brother. The Bible doesn't say God shall provide for himself the lamb, the New King James Bible. It said God shall provide himself. Not just providing for himself. He will provide himself as the lamb. But anyways, that's what Paul's doing. He is opening and alleging from the scriptures that Jesus Christ is exactly who he claimed to be and that he is the son of God. Now what happens in verse number 4 is exactly what Jesus said would happen if he would be lifted up. Jesus said in the book of John, he said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto myself. Hey, 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 if you'll lift Jesus up, it'll fight, somebody will come. You may not get everybody you want to come, and neither does Paul, but somebody will come. Just keep lifting Jesus up. Watch what happens after Paul for three weeks lifts Jesus up, lifts Jesus up, verse 4. And some of them believed, talking about these Jews at the synagogue, some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas. And of the devout Greeks, a great multitude, and of the chief women, not a few. Isn't it something only some of the Jews believed, but a great multitude of these Gentile Greeks believe. Now I want y'all to understand this and you know this. You know this. The reason why only some of these Jews believed is it is hard for a real religious person to see their need for Jesus Christ. That's what these Jews are. They're real religious. They, we believe in God. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Yeah, but do you know Jesus Christ in the pardon of your sin? I live by the law. I'm good to my fellow man. I'm like the Pharisee said over there. I tithe of all my income in the week. And I fast twice in the week. And I'm good to people. I'm a good person. Wonderful. Have you been born again? Have you ever trusted Jesus Christ to save you because you're a sinner? Well, I go to the synagogue every Sabbath. You see what I'm saying? The reason why only some of the Jews believed is the more you witness to people and try and deal with people, the more you'll find out it is a lot harder to get religious people to trust Jesus Christ than it is just poor old lost rednecks going to hell without God that don't believe nothing. <laughs> it's, easy. it's a lot easier to talk to just some old heathen, dope-smoking, hippie, redneck, Bud Light drinking, whatever. It's a lot easier to deal with them about their soul. They most of the time know who they are. Tell you who it's hard to convince that they're a sinner and need Jesus. Somebody that sits on a church bench every Sunday. Listens to a priest say an incantation every Sunday. Drink the wine, eat the wafer, go to confessional. Sit in the Episcopal, Presbyterian, Methodist church, whatever. And listen to some dude get up and read the Bible and tell them what, you know, go be a good person. 
And I'm not saying they're not moral. They're great moral people. A lot of these religious folk that are lost, they're, they, they're great neighbors because <laughs> they believe by living by the golden rule. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. They'll help you mow your grass. They'll take care of you if you're down and sick. They're moral. But they don't see their need for a Savior. Why do I need a Savior? I'm, I'm doing pretty good. No, you're lost. But what happens here in the text, some of those believe, some of the real religious Jews believe, but of the devout Greeks, these Greeks, they're just pagans, man. You know, they, 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 don't, they don't have the same convictions and religious manner that the Jews has got. They've been worshiping these false idols and these messed up gods. they just old lost heathens. And of these devout Greeks, a great multitude. And of the chief women, not a few. Uh, look at what these people were before they got saved. Paul writes to them, obviously, in First and Second Thessalonians. Go with me to First Thessalonians and watch what Paul says to them about their own conversion. So we're reading right there in Acts 17 where they got converted. But read First Thessalonians chapter 1. Paul gives us some supplemental information telling us about their conversion. First Thessalonians chapter 1. We'll start reading in verse number 5, 1 Thessalonians 1, 5. Even though we don't read about Paul's specific message as far as the Bible giving us a record in Acts 17 of what exactly he said, 1 Thessalonians 1, 5 tells us how he said it. 1 Thessalonians 1, 5 said, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. These, these Greek Thessalonian people, they started hearing somebody that actually had much assurance. Actually had somebody look at them and tell them, I know where I'm going when I die, how about you? These Greeks are sitting there saying, they ain't, we don't worship any God that lets us know that we can make it for a fact. We don't got no assurance. That guy up there, he's preaching like he's got real assurance. He's confident of this very thing. He which hath begun a good work and you will perform it in the day of Jesus Christ. He's up there preaching saying, I know whom I believe and am persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. And they're sitting there saying, we ain't got assurance like that. I don't even know where I'm going when I die. All these thousands of gods that we got here that we worship, these Greek gods, none of them have given me assurance in my soul that I even know where I'm going to spend eternity at. But this guy, Paul, he's getting up telling us, man, he's got assurance in his heart. and peace. Hey, one of the greatest advertisements for Jesus Christ is a Christian that is assured of their salvation and they know where they're going when they die. Because the people you work around that are lost, they ain't got a clue. The friends you work around in your family that are lost, they ain't got a clue where they're going when they die. They just hoping well, maybe, you know, I think I'm going to be a good person. Maybe I'll make good works that way. My back. But all of a sudden they come across somebody like you say, hey, I know I'm going to heaven when I die. How about you? Hey, I know I'm saved. <laughs> Anyways, he had much assurance. Verse number six, and ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God were to spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. Now here it is, verse 9. This is what I brought you over here for. For they themselves show of us what, mannering of, what manner of entering in we had unto you. Here's how they got saved. Watch this. And how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. That's what salvation is, y'all. You, you turn to God from something. I'm holding on to this. I'm believing in this. I'm trusting in this. But salvation is I'm turning to someone from something. Now, if you ain't never had a time in your life where you turn to someone from something, mark this down, you ain't saved. Salvation's not turning from something to something. Salvation's turning from something to someone. Flee into Christ, flee into God. And he said, when you turned, you didn't just turn and get saved. You turned to serve. You got saved and started serving. What a novel concept that is. You didn't get saved to sit. You got saved to serve. 
saved to do something for God. Anyways, back to our text. That's how they got saved here. We don't like I say it just kind of it glances over it in Act in Acts seventeen four. But if you'll read the books of First and Second Thessalonians, you see much more of the broad scope of their conversion and then their serving the Lord. So the Bible said a multitude of these Greeks get saved and these chief women, a whole bunch of these chief women get saved, which I imagine Paul's tickled that these chief women get saved and start helping him because what was it back in chapter number uh, 13 or 14, he ended up having a, uh, a bunch of women that were the chief women that got after him <laughs> and they hindered his ministry. I don't remember where that was. We looked at it here a while back. I'll find it after a while. But he ended up having a bunch of women that was turned against him. Now here, a bunch of women's turned for him. Praise the Lord for that. And so verse number 5, watch what it says here. Verse 5, Acts 75. But the Jews which believe not. Now here's three words that you need to get a hold of. Here's a fight for everyone. Moved with envy. Now I'll say something about these Jews before I bring it home to me and you about envy. Envy seems to be one of the main motivating factors for a Jew against the work of God. Go back with me to Mark. Look at Mark's gospel. They were envious against the Lord just like they were Paul. The Bible said they're moved with envy. Go to Mark chapter 15. Mark's gospel chapter 15 and verse number 9. Mark 15, 9. Mark 15, 9, but Pilate answered them saying, will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Jesus standing in front of Pilate on this sham of a trial. Verse 10, for he knew that the chief priest had delivered him for envy. Do you realize envy can become something so big in your heart that it'll make you want to kill someone? You realize that's what got that, you realize that's the cause for the very first murder in the Bible. The very first murder in the Bible, Cain killing his brother, the whole cause for the murder was he was envious. You say, what was he envious of? That God testified, according to Hebrews, that God testified of Abel's works that they were righteous. Now, ever how God did that, I'm not exactly sure. The Bible's not clear. I, I personally believe, you know, when you look at the Old Testament, how God differentiated many times uh, in Leviticus with his sacrifices or, or in uh, Kings when the prophets of Baal and Elijah's up on the Mount Carmel, God answered by fire. Personally, I believe that the way that God showed between Cain and Abel that Abel's works were righteous and Cain's wasn't is they both came to worship before the Lord. And the Bible said Cain brought the fruit of the ground. Cain lays his offering up there on his altar, the fruit of the ground, and says, All right, Lord, I worked hard for these taters and tomatoes and worked hard for these beans and corn. And God, I, I really sweated over this stuff right here. Lord, please, God, look at the work of my hands. God, I brought you an offering. Look how hard I work. Here, take this. And old Abel, he walks out to his altar and he brings that lamb and he says, God, I didn't make this lamb. You made this lamb. And I'm so rotten and I'm so wicked and I'm so filthy. Something's got to die for me. And he cuts that lamb's throat and it bleeds out on that altar and they both stand back and about that time the fire comes down over here on this one and says, whoosh. And that old Cain's tomatoes and potatoes and snap beans and corn, it just sits over and rots in the sun. God doesn't do anything with it. God doesn't even take a look at it. And, that, and you know what? Cain started looking at that thing and he said, I'm going to kill that dude. Envy. Envy will make you hate somebody to the point you want to kill them. Uh, we're going to look at that more. Go to Acts chapter 7. If you think that's hyperbole, look at Acts chapter 7. Watch what it said, the reason why Joseph's own brothers in Acts chapter 7, why they spake of killing him, and why they ended up selling him. Which, by the way, they really thought when they sold him that that was killing him because the Egyptians hated the Jews. They hated them because the Bible talks about they were um, shepherds and they hated shepherds. They really thought by selling him down there, they were just going to work him into the dirt till they killed the boy. That's what they thought. They just wasn't going to put their own hand on him. Watch Acts chapter 7 and verse number 9. Acts chapter 7 verse 9. And the patriarchs, what moved them to this? Moved with envy 
sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all his affliction, so on and so forth. Go to chapter 13 of Acts. Look at Acts 13. This envy thing keeps popping up. Acts 13, 45. Acts 13, 45. In verse 45, Acts chapter 13 said, But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Uh, envy is not just something that's indigenous to the Jews. Even though we looked at several spots, the chief priests, the patriarchs that sold Joseph, these people that are aggravated against Paul in Acts 13 and Acts 17, envy is just a product of the flesh. I don't care whether you're a Jew or Gentile. It's in all of us. Envy is a reaction of the flesh that we all got to fight on a regular basis. Getting to the place where you, man, I wish I had what they had. Man, I wish I had the accolades they have. Or man, I wish I had the stuff they got. Or man, I can't stand them because they this, this, or this. And brother, you, you get to the place, you'll start end up Talking about people, plotting people's demise. You know what I've found most of the time the reason is why someone talks real bad a lot of times about someone else to a third party to try and tear somebody down in somebody else's eyes is because they're envious of them. Because they're envious of them. Watch what your Bible says about what lives in us. It lives in us, y'all. We all have to fight it. Look at James. Go to the book of James with me. James chapter 4. Envy is one of those. There are some sins of the flesh that are open and apparent, real easy to spot. You know what I mean? But y'all listen to me. Envy is one of those sins. It can just slip up into your life without you even knowing it got up in there. And all of a sudden become a major part of your life without you even knowing it's there until it gets pointed out and you start realizing, oh, man, you know the reason why I do that? It's because it's envy. You know the reason why I'm saying that? It's because it's envy. You got to check your own spirit because that spirit lives in us. Watch James chapter 4, verse number 4. James 4, 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Watch what he said, verse 5. Do ye think that the Scripture saith in vain, the Spirit, not the Holy Spirit, your Spirit, the Spirit that dwelleth in us, lusteth to envy. Matter of fact, according to that, what it's saying is the Spirit that lives in us, it wants to envy. It lusts to envy. It has a desire to do so, to be envious. En envy could be not just envious of somebody, but, but envy is almost like covetousness. You see something and you want it. Desire it real bad and envious that you don't have it. Matter of fact, watch what the psalmist said. Go back with me to Psalms. Watch what the psalmist said. Um... Go back to the book of the Psalms. Man, this envy thing, the more you chew on it, it just gets bigger and bigger. It's all through the scripture. Psalm 37. This is David talking. Psalm 37, verse number 1. Hmm. I, I didn't actually look at the reference in my Bible when I had wrote it down the other day in study. Now that I'm looking at it in my Bible, this has nothing to do with what I'm fixing to say, but this was a blessing. I have a note written next to this. Psalm 37, 1 says, fret not thyself because of evildoers. I have a note written right here. I read this in daily Bible reading on the day Joe Biden was inaugurated as president. I did. I got this my note. I just saw it. It's a blessing, though. I just saw it right now. I said, good advice. January the 20th, 2021. Fret not thyself because of evildoers. Because I was kind of tore up that day. <laughs> the Lord spoke to my heart, though, that day. He said, hey, don't worry about that. I'm glad I read it again. I needed to hear that again, just to be honest with you. Thank you, Lord. Appreciate that. That's why you need to make notes to yourself in your Bible. 
Put dates with them too. It'll be a blessing to you. Anyways, what I brought you over here for was the last part of the verse. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, last part of the verse. Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. Y'all listen to me. You can get to the place where you start looking at lost people and you start looking at the world and you start getting envious. I wish our young people was in here to hear this too. You start getting envious and saying, well, I wish I could dress like they dress. And I wish I could listen to what they listen to. And man, look at how much fun it seems like they're having. Boy, look at all the good time it seems like they're having. No, don't get envious of that. Watch the next verse. For they, soon, uh, th- for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord, do good, so, thou sh- so shalt thou dwell in the land. Verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, who shall give thee the desire of thy heart, so on and so forth. Don't start worrying about what the evil's doing and looking at them and saying, man, I wish I could do that. Delight yourself in the Lord. Don't get envious of them. If David could say he had to be reminded not to get envious of the wicked, I need to be reminded of that. And if David's song leader had to be reminded of it, I need to be reminded of it. Look at David's, David's song leader is Asaph. Asaph's a great guy. Psalm 73 is one of the greatest psalms in the Bible. Psalm 73 is the first psalm that Asaph writes, but it's like it's the first in a, in a row of 11 or 12 psalms that Asaph writes. Look at Psalm 73, verse number, verse number 2. Psalm 73, 2. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. Verse 3. How did he start slipping? How did he start slipping almost out of the house of God and get gone? Verse 3, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. You know what will start getting you gone out of the house of God? Boy, I'm, them other guys, they work on Sunday and look at the extra money they make. Yeah, but you ain't like them. You're saved. Man, I look at how they make, you know, me and Brother Charlie was talking the other day, and I appreciate Brother Charlie, and he, we was talking on the way to Kentucky the other day, and he was, he was saying how he, he wanted to try a little while back and get out of um, either the finance part of the car industry or selling them or which one it was. He can correct me afterwards, and he got into service instead. And he said the whole reason I got out of it is, he said, they push you so hard to be dishonest with people about stuff to try and sell and make money on stuff. He said, no, I just wasn't willing to do it. I appreciate that. I appreciate somebody that's a Christian on their job. But, you know, it'd be real easy to get in that and say, see the prosperity of the wicked and see, man, I can make more money if I do it like this. I can make more money if I lied about that. Get envious of that stuff. No, I'm not willing to do it. Not willing to compromise. You fellas that are in business or work, don't, don't get envious of the way the guys on the job do it and they may make a little more money than you and climb the ladder faster than you, but they're doing it unscrupulously. Don't get envious about that stuff. That, and that's what happened to old Asaph. He got envious about it. What fixed his perspective on his envy? Verse 17. Look at Psalm 73, 17. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I therein. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down in destruction, so on and so forth. How did he finally get his perspective fixed and he stopped being envious? He got to the house of God and heard the word of God read and the songs of God being sung, got around God's people, and he said, you know what? There ain't nothing out there worth being envious over. I'm not missing out on nothing. This world tries to promote to our kids that they're all missing out. They're missing out. Look what you're missing out on. Yeah, what, what are you missing out on? You're missing out on scars on your life from premarital sex with somebody that ain't going to be your husband or your wife? You, you, you missing out on, on getting your first taste of liquor that robs you of your mind and your mouth and your purity? You, you missing out on that first line of cocaine that you snort that's going to wind you up either in a ditch somewhere or wrapped around a tree in a car? You, There ain't nothing this world's got that we're missing out on. They're the ones missing out. We have nothing to be envious of, y'all. And it ain't just getting envious of the world. Paul hammers this thing home that we have to be careful not to be envious of each other. Don't be envious even of each other. Hang on, there's another reference I had written down here in Proverbs. 
I'll just read it to you. Proverbs 24, 1 said, Be not thou envious against evil men, neither desire to be with them. Proverbs 24, 19 said, Fret not thyself because of evil men, neither be thou envious at the wicked. For there shall be no reward to the evil man. The candle of the wicked shall be put out. That was good advice. Go with me to the New Testament. Look at Galatians. Watch Paul's advice to you and I as the body of Christ, as the church of Jesus Christ. We don't just have to be careful about being envious of the world. Let your flesh and that spirit in us start lusting to envy about things that we have no business lusting to envy on. That's why Paul said over there, um, uh, was it Hebrews chapter 13, Paul said, and be content with such things as you have. Do you know what, I mean, you, you can't help it, you're in this world, but you're not of this world. But you're watching TV. You know what every ad on that TV is? It is designed for you to envy something. Oh, you need this. You got to have that. Oh, look at this guy. Don't you wish your husband looked like him? Oh, look at this woman. Don't you wish your wife was like her? Envy. It, you, need, you, need, you need that. You got to have this. It's becoming envious at the world and the wicked. That's what it's all designed for. You got to be careful on that thing because there's a spirit in us that's lusting that way. <laughs> It ain't like you got to try and get it pushed that way. It's running that way. You have to have the Holy Ghost keeping on a leash not to go that way. That dog will bite. Galatians chapter 5, watch what Paul said in verse number uh, 25. Galatians 5, 25. Paul has been talking about the works of the flesh and the works of the spirit. Well, back up real fast. Watch one of the works of the flesh. Back up to verse number 20, Paul tells us the works of the flesh are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Verse 20, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Verse 21. He puts envying right next to murdering and, drunk and drunkenness. God help. And come all the way down, what's, how do we combat this envy in our flesh, in the spirit? Verse 25 and 26, if we live in the capital S spirit, the Holy Spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. Brother, be careful about envying your brother. Sister, be careful about envying your sister. Listen to me, listen to me. If all of a sudden you look across the way and they come riding in in a new vehicle, don't get envious about that. Say, praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Rejoice with them that rejoice. You know what envy will start doing? Here's how envy does. Here's how envy does. Here's how envy does. They ride in in a new car and you look at it and you're envious of it. And so then what you do is you go tell some other brother or some other sister, I, I, bet, I bet they ain't tithing. That's how they got that. You know what I mean? You're going to tear them down because you're envious. Some, you know, some lady come walking in in a dress that you wish you had, and you're like, I'm going to tell you what, that dress doesn't flatter her at all, does it? <laughs> you, you'll start tearing somebody down just for the simple fact of envy. But I'm talking from the pulpit to the pew. We all got that raging monster that we got to fight against. Why? It, it, it obviously is such a monster. Back to our text. Back to Acts 17, we got to close. It obviously is such a monster that in lost men, don't think it's not still in you even though you're saved. It's still in you even though you are saved. But in lost men, brother, it caused Paul's ministry multitudes of trouble multiple times because people was envious. That's why the Lord was delivered unto Pilate. That's why Paul suffered a lot of stuff he suffered. Envy. God help us to keep it run out of our heart so we keep it run out of our church. Verse 5, but the Jews which believed not moved with envy, took unto them, don't you love the wording of the King James Bible? Check this next few lines out. I love this. Took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. I love that. Don't change my King James Bible. That is, that is an awesome way to say that. The word lewd simply means they're vile, they're wicked. 
Baser means they're base, they're low, like baseboard. You know, that means they're low character people. They're down low. He took wicked, vile, low character people. What did these wicked, vile, low character people do? Well, they gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason. That's who Paul's staying with. Assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. It takes lewd, base people to start riots, assault houses, and tear things up. I'm looking at you, Antifa and Black Lives Matter. <laughs> I mean, it takes lewd, base people that just run through a whole section of some town and just burn everything down. <laughs> We're mad. So you burnt your own Walmart down? And then you're going to be mad at Walmart because they don't put another store there and they leave. I wouldn't put one in your section of town either. <laughs> you literally go burn your own town to the ground and then get mad when the government don't come back and build it up. Are you nuts? It, I'm simply saying it takes lewd people that are the baser sort. Vile, wicked people that are low character to do stupid stuff like that. That's dumb. Anyways, and they assaulted Jason's house. Jason is a name you don't hear often. It's only mentioned a few times in the Bible, but he is, Paul says that he's one of his work fellows. He's a blessing to Paul. He obviously is a man that Paul led to the Lord, and now Paul, uh, Jason lets him stay at his house. Almost everywhere Paul you know, worked at, he had somebody like Lydia back in chapter 16. Somebody let him stay at the house for his base of operation. All right, let's keep reading here, and we'll close. Verse number 6. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren of the rulers of the city. Isn't that something? <laughs> They're looking for Paul and Silas, but they don't find them. But Jason is guilty by association. So let's just draw Jason out. Jason hadn't been doing the preaching. Jason hadn't been doing the leading people of the Lord. That's been Paul. But if people can't stop the preaching and they can't stop the ministry, you know what they'll do? They'll try and intimidate the membership. So if they can't intimidate the preacher and the preaching, here's what they'll do. They'll start telling all the membership, oh, y'all remember that cult down there? <laughs> y'all following a man down there. No, that's just they're just trying to intimidate people because they can't stop what's going on. Anyways, and I love what they say. We're done right here. I love what they say at the end. They cried this. These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Like Brother Zach said in that message he preached, it's really not turning the world upside down. It's really turning it right side up. Sin turned the world upside down. The gospel turns it back right. Yeah, if you, ain't, if you don't know Jesus Christ, your world's upside down. But the Lord can make your world right side up. But it takes the gospel. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the lessons we learned this morning through this church at Thessalonia. God, I pray that you would help us to apply these principles. And Lord, maybe the main principle that you try to get across to my heart and the hearts of your people this morning is not to be envious of evildoers this morning. Not to get our eyes on this world and start thinking that we're missing out on something and we wish we had this or wish we could be like them. Lord, help us to just try and be God's people and find delight in walking with God and living a holy, clean life. That Lord, the, 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 there's enough of our past in here, enough of us that have done things that we're not proud of and lived in a wicked way that we can all look back and say, Lord, there ain't nothing back there living in the world that's worth going back to. Living for Jesus is the greatest life on the planet. God, help us to always keep that philosophy and keep coming to the house of God so you can keep our mindset updated on that regularly and reminded of that. God, we'll thank you for it now. Bless the 11 o'clock hour. Save some soul for Jesus' sake. And we'll give you the thanks and the praise and the glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, praise the Lord.